greetings. Uh, let's pray. We thank you, Lord God, our Creator and Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, that you did not keep yourself aloof and apart from your people, but that you chose to live with them and us. We thank you that in your Son, Jesus, you've made your dwelling place with us. Give us your grace today so that we may live with you as you live with us and that wherever you go, you may be with us. Please guide us and direct us in all that we do and think and say and are this day. We commend ourselves and this community, our families, and all those dear to us in Jesus' name. Amen. The topic for today is the tabernacle and the divine service. Which, as you probably realize, is a matter that's very dear to me. Um, first of all, the tabernacle, and then what happens at the tabernacle, the divine service. You remember that as part of God's gift to his people at Mount Sinai, as part of his side of the covenant with his people, he gave them the divine service and everything to do with the divine service. The priesthood, the tabernacle, and then the ritual, the service, that was enacted every morning, every evening at the tabernacle. Now I'd like to look at that more closely and touch on the main theological parts of this. However, the danger is that we abstract the theology to a set of ideas from the practicalities of what occurs. That's a big danger for us modern people. We get ideas and float them loose from concrete realities. And the most concrete reality is the tabernacle itself. Um, let me just describe it for you. Uh, give it here in uh, as concrete a form as possible. Um, going from the outside inside, the tabernacle was, if you like, an open air sanctuary. An open air sanctuary fenced in by a curtain. Now there were stands and there were it was a curtained off area, a fenced off area. And the only entrance was on the east side. So it had faced east, north, south, east, west. The orientation is very important. Everything is symbolically significant here. Um, okay, so you enter via the eastern court, uh, uh, gate, and there's only one entrance. And the tabernacle itself, the area, is uh, designed in the forms of cubes. You know, cube which is the perfect shape. Um, so you have the outer court here, which is cube shaped, and then you have the inner court, which is cube shaped. You have the altar, which is cube shaped. You have the Holy of Holies, which is cube shaped and then the holy place, which is a double cube. Now, um, the precincts themselves uh, fall into two parts. There's the outer court here, this area, in the form of a cube. What stands at the center here? The altar for burnt offering. Can you see I've got this this diagonals here to indicate that this is the center of the outer cube. And then you have the inner cube here, and at the center of the inner cube lies the um, 
uh, Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat and the cherubim which forms the throne of the invisible hidden God. So uh, if you get the two central features here, uh, the altar for burnt offering and the uh, mercy seat, the throne of God. Uh, now, coming in this way, uh, you have the altar for burnt offering. As you see here, 5-5, five, five, it's cube-shaped. What I haven't indicated here is that there are steps leading up to it. Um, this side here, okay? Um, and that altar uh, is, has four horns on the four corners of it. There's lots of other details about it that you can work out for yourself, but for the purposes of what we want to do today, that suffices. Then, between the altar for burnt offering and the entrance here to the tabernacle, the tent, um, you have the wash basin, the laver, the, the water source. Now, the priest on duty will wash his hands and his feet before he goes in and after he comes out. So notice the strategic location of the wash basin there. Think in terms of the font in our churches. Then we come to the uh, uh, inner court. Now, um, the inner court is the, the, whole, the closer you come, the holier you get this. All this area here is the sanctuary, is holy. Um, but uh, here, the most holy part of the outer court is the altar for burnt offering and the laver, wash basin. They are most holy. Only a priest is allowed to uh, approach them and touch those most holy furnishings. Then you come to the inner, or maybe I should be going this way. Then you come to the uh, inner court, and you have um, this tent, which is, if you like, God's residence. God's personal residence here on earth. It's a mobile residence, a bit like a king when he uh, leads an army, you know, uh, uh, because it's on the move. The, res the, re the residence of the commander-in-chief of the army. Now, uh, the outer part of the tent is a, a public space. This is, uh, if you like, the office of the general, the, his place where he interacts with his officers, with his uh, courtiers, and the inner place is the, uh, his private quarters. That's reserved for him, him only. Um, only those who work together with him are allowed here. As you know, the priest on duty uh, enters the holy place morning and evening to interact with God. And there are three main items of furniture here. There is the altar of incense just before the curtain. Um, the curtain here which separates this part, the holy place, from the most holy place. Now that curtain is not a single curtain, but is a double curtain. You have two items of uh, cloth hanging so you don't go straight through like that push the curtain aside but to enter it you go to the side and you go down between the curtains and you come here in front of the mercy seat the throne right so it's a double curtain so Hebrews talks about us having a new and living way through the curtain of Christ's flesh uh, and unless you, see, unless you see the actual arrangement of this, you won't make sense of the idea as a curtain being a way. Right, so there's a double layered curtain here. Um, let's, the outer 
uh, holy place has three items. There's the altar for incense. There's the table for showbread. Now on the table for showbread you have 12 round pitta loaves, flat bread loaves made of unleavened bread. They are in layers of six. So there's a pile of six and another pile of six. It's not a very big table, about so big. One pile of six loaves, another pile of six loaves. And next to those loaves, then you have bowls with incense on them. <coughs> okay, now, those loaves are changed every Sabbath day. They are the bread of the presence, the show bread. Now, the bread itself isn't burnt, but every Sabbath day, the incense which accompanies them is burnt together with the other incense on the incense altar. And the bread itself, which is most holy and therefore communicates God's holiness, is eaten by the priests on duty. Okay, that's the show bread. Notice the show bread um, with the. Um, a table for the showbread. So they this, eat, eat the ones a week old and then yes. replace them with new. They, they, on the Sabbath day they eat last week's bread and they put new bread there. It's unleavened bread so it keeps fairly well. Um, then there is the lamb stand. As you know the lamb stand uh, has seven branches to it and those seven branches have seven cups that contain seven bowls for the seven lamps, incense lamps. So it's not, it's, it's, it's used as very precious olive oil. A seven branched lamp stand um, are made in the shape of a flower. The cups itself are stylized so that they look like an almond tree and the cups are like almond flowers and the cups themselves are shaped like almonds. Uh, flattened out. And you know you have the classical lamps which is like that. Uh, you have a wick that floats there and you've got the uh, olive oil there that provides the light for the lamp. Seven lamps. Seven lamps. Now every morning, every evening the priest on duty attends to the lamps. Um, trims them uh, and uh, you know, by that stage many of them will have burnt out. Um, he will uh, get rid of any ash from it and uh, put oil in the lamps uh, for the next night. Um, now if the lamps are gone out then he'll get fire from the altar here from a coal and he will trim one of the lamps and keep it going during the day because in the evening all the lamps need to be lit. So there is the lamp stand, the menorah, which is one of the great symbols of Judaism to the present day. The altar for incense is square, not very large, about so big, has four horns on it, metal top, and you, the priest puts coals on it from the altar for burnt, from burnt offering and on top of the coals you have incense. A very powerful, precious, most holy incense. The incense itself can only be used here at the, uh, at the tabernacle. It can't be used anywhere else for any other purposes. It is most holy. And if, since it's most holy, anything that it permeates becomes holy. Right? And notice that incense is burnt in front of the throne of God. But there's a curtain here between this altar and God's presence. Now normally speaking, uh, nobody enters this place. The double curtain and its arrangement as a perfect cube, um, in fact it's a uh, it's shaped like a wooden case with an entrance only one side. No light goes in. It is total, utterly dark. Completely black. You can't see a jolly thing, let's say, if you went in there. Um, 
It's once a year on the Day of Atonement that the High Priest enters that most holy of all holy places. But before he goes there, he will bring incense to the side and bring it in black incense. So that makes sure that it's even blacker than black. Um, and it's there that on the Day of Atonement, the High Priest on duty will sprinkle blood on the floor and then also on the mercy seat itself. That's the basic arrangement. Now the furniture of it. Now um, everything here is significant liturgically and theologically. There is here something surprising. If this was a pagan sanctuary, what would be located here in the Holy of Holies? An idol. And if for pagans, the Holy of Holies was the place that had the strongest light. He made sure that light was there. But what kind of a place is this? A place of total darkness. And uh, instead of an idol, you have an empty throne. So you have a place of darkness and an empty throne. Now for pagan people, if they wanted to meet with their gods, they would go to the most holy place. They would bow before their god and meet him there. But this is not the meeting place with God. Where does God meet with his people? Here. The altar is the meeting place. Um, the altar, God comes from here to here to meet with his people who come from here to here. Very strange. Um, there's also something strange out here. For pagan people, the altar was the place where they sacrificed the animals, which is killed the animals. But the killing doesn't occur at the altar. The killing of the animals, the preparation of the food stuff that's offered to God is done up here. The altar is used as a table rather than as a killing site, as a slaughter place. Nothing is slaughtered on the altar. So any questions just about that before I explain the ritual and the theological significance of the ritual that occurs in this location? Vaughan? Uh, just about the killing. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's, that's for the public offerings. Um, say if you brought an animal, you would kill it out here somewhere. Um, but the daily, the offerings that are presented by the priests and killed by the priests and offered by the priests on behalf of the nation are done here in this area to the north of the altar. Okay? Any other questions? Yes? Was there, uh, was there an understanding of um, not quite omnipresence but presence in two places at once? If, if God was meeting with his people at the altar of burnt offering, would, would the priests have understood that, well, he's no longer in the Holy of Holies, or is he in both places at once? Um, that's a very modern uh, problem. It's funny that we, we think that ancient people were far more primitive than us, but in fact, our modern scientific way of thinking makes us spiritually far more primitive than ancient people. If I can turn things on their head, yeah, they had no problems with that. Um, and the problem wasn't where God was present. Even for pagan people, their God could be present anywhere. The, the question wasn't where God was, their gods were present, but the, uh, the, the question was where could they access their God? And how could they access the spiritual realm, the supernatural realm, or you know, however you'd like to put it? How could they access uh, the heavenly realm here on earth? Um, uh, both for Jews and for pagan people, um, you know, and notice omnipresence is a philosophical idea. Uh, they had, but they had no problems with the 
omnipresence of their gods, but they wouldn't even think in those terms. That's a modern philosophical way of thinking. Yeah. Um, don't fall into the trap of assuming, and this is a modern thing, that these people are dumb, we are sophisticated. That is arrogant and stupid. Yep? Um, can I ask, what's the significance of all the squares? And um, is it something to do maybe with not having an image and that the square is actually quite a, a nondescript kind of form, whereas a curved line can be a bit more uh, image or Well, one of the things that it emphasizes is the notion of order. Okay. Um, and one of the principles that Isaiah enunciates is that uh, God has chosen not to be located in chaos or in darkness, but in order. Um, and so one of the things about Israelite worship as compared to pagan worship is its orderedness. By the way, that's very significant for us because one of the problems that we have coming out of uh, our modern way of thinking, we want to have, uh, you know, we prize spontaneity, flexibility, even disorder. But Jewish worship, Christian worship, Muslim worship has always been emphasized order. So the order of worship, to put it in modern terms, is theologically far more significant than most modern people make it out to be and most modern Lutherans make it out to be. God is a God of order, not of disorder and chaos. And um, uh, now, there's all sorts of symbolism then with cubes and this kind of ge ge geometry that you find here. Um, but the cube is the perfect shape. You like uh, now uh, the order here however is not mathematical and geometrical the order that I want to explain is theological somebody yes Nathan with the incense yes your incense at that period have a particular meaning associated with it but now with the not that smells on us but in the past it relates other things and do we know which particular incense was used we have a very detailed description of the ingredients of that incense in Exodus 30. The ingredients actually listed. Um, much of that can be identified um, to the present day from what we know. Some of it is uncertain. Now, incense of it, there's many different kinds of incense. But incense is something that when you burn, smells sweet. Now, uh, there's a bit of a paradox usually because usually when you burn something it produces smoke which is sour and acrid but here you get the paradox that uh, it's sweet and that you burn something to produce a sweet aroma. Um, so it has a very clear function both in, in a secular sense but also not just in Israel but everywhere in the ancient world incense was used in connection with uh, uh, offerings to the God. On its most practical level, it's meant to put you in a good mood. So if you burn incense in front of a king, it's to put the king in a good mood, to make him happy. It's a bit like uh, an, um, uh, wearing perfume, your wife wearing perfume, uh, to make herself attractive and presentable. Okay? So uh, it's to make to, to make somebody sweet to you or to make yourself sweet to somebody. Now, out of that comes its theological significance. Is there anything wrong with the modern day practice of burning incense in home? No. 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 Nor is there anything wrong with using incense in church. The only problem is to use incense that uh, doesn't create problems for people with uh, uh, asthma. Um, some of the cheap and common form of incense uh, are very, very asthma inducing. As you probably know, Catholics and uh, uh, Orthodox people use a lot of incense in their worship. Anglicans, some Lutherans do. I don't know of the use of incense anywhere in Australia, but you go overseas, um, Lutherans in Scandinavia, 
Sweden, some parts of Germany, North America, hmm? Baltic countries, yes, Latvia, uh, use incense quite regularly in the divine service. It's a very ancient custom and comes here from the Old Testament. Anything else? Okay, just now, keep that picture in mind. Now, I want to go through uh, some of the theology and some of the ritual then that's enacted at that location. You see, ritual um, is uh, God institutes a particular ritual because through that ritual, God meets with his people, God interacts with his people. And he, it, this doesn't do, happen anyhow. Human beings don't set the agenda here. God sets the agenda so that he can deliver the gifts that he wants to give to his people rather than the gifts that the people want to receive from him or offer to him. God sets the agenda. And so everything here is significant. If I had time, I could do a, a whole, spend a whole course just going on every detail here of the tabernacle, the priest furnishings, all that kind of stuff. Everything is significant, symbolically, and everything connects with the central fact. Now, what's the central fact here? The one and only God who is hidden, whose glory is hidden in a cloud here in the Holy of Holies, comes and makes himself known makes himself available, uh, makes himself accessible to his people here at the altar. And he comes there to bless his people. And the people come to meet with God, to present their petitions to God, in order to receive blessings from God. Everything focuses on that interaction, that reality, that a holy God meets with an unclean, sinful people in a way that's beneficial and not de detrimental to both parties. It doesn't desecrate God's holiness and it doesn't uh, destroy the people, damage the people because of their sinfulness. Uh, that's the central uh, purpose of all of this. And all the symbolism, everything here is designed by God to make that possible. Okay, now, the tabernacle itself. Uh, now, the problem here is language. Um, uh, the tabernacle, what's the tabernacle when we talk about the tabernacle? Is this tent structure here. But you need to see that the tabernacle never exists by itself. It, it exists within this enclosed space this curtain fenced off space. Um, it's part of an open air sanctuary. Um, the most significant place for a lay person, for an ordinary place, is not this part here, but it's the altar here. That's the significant thing. So they know what's inside? They know what's inside. Everybody knows what's inside because unlike some esoteric religions, nothing's hidden. Um, now, all this is available to them. Everybody knows what it looks like, even though nobody's been there. There's no secret words. There's no secret doctrine. There's no esoteric initiation rites which leads you, like Freemasonry, into uh, more secret and higher secrets. Like Gnosticism, you go into secret, esoteric stuff. This is all open knowledge. Let me have a look at the... Uh, terms for the tabernacle now. Can we go to uh, Tom, Exodus chapter 25, 8 to 9, to start off with? Exodus 25, 8 to 9. And have them make me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them in accordance with all that I, that I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, you shall make it. Now, um, a couple of things here. First, according to the pattern that I will show them, um, Bana is to build pattern or model if it is tough beneath. God up on the mountain in, uh, shows Moses the heavenly prototype 
of what he builds the copy here on earth. So right at the beginning you have the idea that something here on earth copies what exists in the heavenly realm. So God's true residence is there in heaven. Moses is shown um, the model or the master plan up in heaven of what he builds here on earth. Tavneth. Very important to see this, the, 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 the force of this word. And you'll find that word model, copy, um, uh, all the way through this legislation. Secondly, the um, thing that Moses is to build is given two names. First of all, it's called a, a Mishkan. Mishkan. Now, usually that's translated as tabernacle, which is most unfortunate. Mishkan is the noun from shakan, uh, which means to dwell, to reside, to be at home. It's quite a concrete term. So my residence is in Glengowrie. That's the place where I live, my dwelling place, my residence. The, um, this tent is to be God's Mishkan, his dwelling place, his residence, his home. And that's translated as tabernacle. Most people haven't a clue what tabernacle means, but that's a Latin word meaning a tent. Unfortunately, the theology is always lost when it's translated that way. Let them make me a dwelling place, a residence. Now, the remarkable thing is that God, whose proper residence in heaven, chooses to live in the middle of his people, with his people, to reside with them, to live with them. Theologically, very, very significant. And from this, you get the very famous Jewish term, which is sort of late Hebrew, God's Shekinah, which is God's dwelling with his people, the dwelling of his glory with his people. The glory cloud is God's Shekinah, his dwelling. Secondly, they are to build a sanctuary. So the first picture, theologically, you have is that the tabernacle is God's residence. Now, if it's God's residence, what does it mean practically for the Israelites? If you know where I live, visit. you can come and visit me. Okay, we can arrange for a visit. Okay, that's number one. So you can visit. This is a God who can be visited, who can be accessed. And it can be accessed at this place. Now, that Mishkan is a sanctuary. Now, in a broad sense, sanctuary is all this area. Sanctuary just means holy place. All this is holy. Why is it holy? Because it belongs to God. It's God's zone. It's God's place. It's what belongs to Him. More narrowly, the sanctuary is this. So, in a broad sense, all this is God's sanctuary. More narrowly, the sanctuary is this zone here, which includes Holy of Holies, Holy Place, Wash Basin, and the Altar for Burnt Offering. This is the zone here, if I can put it that way, that only priests are allowed to go. Levites can go here as well. Israelites can only go up to that point here. This is the court of the Israelites, this part here, up to the altar. So, um, you have the holy place, and in the holy place you have the hakodesh, the holiness, the holy place. Now, once again, the, um, uh, the, the language is usage is fluid. Please take note, in, uh, uh, if you're working with Hebrew, that uh, you, uh, the same word can be used in different senses in different contexts. Something sometimes hakodesh, the holy place, can be this area here. Sometimes it is this area. But most commonly, the holy place is this area here. The holy place, this place, the place where the priests 
interact with God and God interacts with the priests every morning and every evening. So that's the holy place. And uh, this place here, that hidden area up here, is called the Holy of Holies. Kodesh HaKodashim. As you know, in Hebrew, to repeat a word is to give the superlative Greek. This is the holy of all holy places, so, which means that this is the place that makes all other places holy. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the language here indicates that uh, we're dealing with God's holiness, and here God uh, shares his holiness, not just with people, but also with places and things. And corresponding to this, you get a graded system of holiness. There's some things that are most holy, they sanctify by contact with them. And then there are some things that are holy, they derive their holiness from the most holy things, but in themselves they don't communicate holiness. So a priest is holy, but if you touch a priest, you don't become holy. But if you touch the altar, if you touch the laver, if you touch anything that's been placed on this, then you become holy. So the most holy things communicate holiness by contact with them. Yes? The yes. But is it that what you touch is what has been on the altar? So the altar. Yes, so lay people can touch mo some most holy things, but uh, not the altar itself, but the things that have been placed on the altar. Sure, and the closest they can get is to touch their branches. The yes, there's once a year on the um, Feast of Tabernacles, the closest the lay people can get is the branches. They touch the four horns of the altar as they go in proce procession but they cannot actually put their hand on it and they can't go up the steps to present their offerings to the Lord. But even on the, um, that most holy time, the Feast of Tabernacles, no lay person can ever enter the Holy of Holies. I mean the holy place, let alone the Holy of Holies. No priest, no Levite, ordinary one, can go in this place. Only the high priest can once a year. So you get a system of graded access to God, graded holiness. But the reverse is also true, and we're coming to that in the next unit we'll be doing. The demands for ritual purity become higher the closer you come to God. So the demands for purity of the high priest are higher than the priest, priests than Levites, and Levites than the holy Israelites. Now, the purpose of this um, place is for God to meet with his people. Now I'd like to give you a whole range of very, very important terminology. Um, stuff that can't, as is often the case, is not evident in our, tr our translations. And it all hinges on the notion of meeting. Now, when I'm talking about meeting, I'm not talking about meeting of two people who happen to be walking along the road and they coincide with each other or uh, you happening to meet somebody at morning tea, but meeting here in the sense of an official arranged meeting of an important person with somebody who's inferior to them. So by meeting, um, you know, think in terms of you arranging a meeting with, uh, say, our principal, John Henderson, or you arranging a meeting with Mike Semler in his office. What you do, if you're going to meet with an important person, you need to set a time and a place for meeting. So it's official meeting. And the symbolism here is the meeting of citizens with a king. So it's, it, what you have here is royal imagery, royal terminology. Okay, now um, let me go through the three important words that come and are used here. Ya'ad is arranged to meet. Moses says to Pharaoh that God has arranged to meet with his people in the desert. Ya'ad. 
He's arranged a meeting. Um, the, but the commonest one is the use of the nifal, no of, to meet with a person, in this case to meet with God, to meet with the king, at a uh, prescribed time, at a set time, and at a set place. To meet in audience with the king. So if you think in terms of Mr. Rudd, say, you obviously can't bowl up to him and meet with him whenever you wish. Um, in fact, none of us can, could possibly meet with Mr. Rudd. It'd be impossible. Although in the ancient world, any citizen could, if they got, chose the right time and right place, meet with their kings and queens. So uh, can you idea see the idea is of meeting. Now, why would somebody want to meet with their king? And you need to keep this in mind to make sense of it. Why would a king arrange to meet with his people and why would people want to meet with their king? You know, quite frankly, I have no interest in meeting with Mr. Rudd. Right? The thing was that what you could do in the ancient world is to present petitions to the king. And those petitions could be for yourself or it could be for other people. It could be for your community, the family, the whole nation. Uh, you meet with the king in order to petition the king. And that's the point of this meeting. With God, they come there. God wants to give them gifts, but he wants them to set the agenda of what gifts to give them. They um, petition him. So you arrange to meet with somebody, a king, to petition the king. Now you get two other words that come from this verbal root. Moaith. You know from your Hebrew that a maim in front of a verbal root indicates uh, usually uh, the place in which that action is done or the action itself. Remember that? So you put a maim in front of a verbal root and you get the place of the action or the action itself. Now, a moave is a meeting time. Now, God has set certain times to meet with his people. There are meeting times every day. Which are they? Morning, evening. There are meeting times every month. There's new moon and full moon. And then there are annual meeting times. And then among the annual meeting times, and I won't go to the full number of them, there are special annual meeting times which are called pilgrim festivals. Uh, which are the three great pilgrim festivals in which the uh, representatives of the whole nation, all the families, come to meet with God at this place? Tabernacles and what? These are the feasts. Tabernacles is one of the pilgrim festivals. What are the other two? Passover, Passover and Tabernacles. Tabernacles booths is the same thing. So you get the one that's coming up for the Jewish calendar is Passover and then 50 days after Passover you get Pentecost. Uh, Passover, autumn, uh, spring equinox, the Tabernacles, Autumn Equinox. Remember that? So you get, those are all meeting times. So a ma Moed is a meeting time, but it's also a meeting place. This here is God's Moed, his meeting place. And uh, most specially, there is one place here that is called the Tent of Meeting, What's the tent of meeting? Work out? What in this courtyard is the tent of meeting? Not the Holy of Holies because that's the holy place. Now, who is this the tent of meeting for? So the holy place is the tent of meeting for whom? The priest, not all priests, but the priest on duty each morning and evening. So this is the place, if you like, where the priests meet with God and are briefed by God every morning, every evening. If you can think of Mr. Howard as his bureaucracy, has his officials, he has his private secretary, um, 
every morning, once a day at least, he would meet with his personal staff. Okay, this is the picture here. The priests meeting with God um, for uh, interacting with God. So this is the tent of meeting, not the tent of meeting for the Israelites, but the tent of meeting for the priests. Um, and then thirdly, the um, moed can be used for what you do at this time and this place which is this meeting, this interaction between God and his people. And then thirdly now, we come to a very important term, edha. Um, notice you get the yod falls away, and you get the e-a-d and the r ending, the feminine r ending, um, is the people who meet with God at that place and at those times, so the people who meet with God are, are the other. Um, they are what we would call the congregation. So the congregation of Israel, every morning, every day, are the people who actually meet with God. Now there's two terms that are used in Hebrew for what we would call church. The one is kachal. Kahal comes from the verb to gather, the whole gathering, the whole assembly of Israel. They are all the people who, over the space of a year or more, have at some times met with God, assembled in God's presence. But the other are the people who any one day um, uh, assemble with God. If I can explain in terms of my own congregation, um, the, uh, our church community has a membership of about, say, three or four hundred at Glenorg. Um, you know, and then there's other attachments, three, say three hundred and something. But any one Sunday, all those three hundred won't be there. There'll be about a hundred and uh, thirty, hundred and forty who actually assemble at uh, Glenorg, St Paul's Glenorg. Now, which of those two, the full membership or the people who assembly is the ether of St. Paul's Lutheran Church. People the people who actually assemble there Sunday by Sunday and meet with God, um, receive God's blessings and petition God for the things that they need. So that's the ether, that's the congregation. Um, so like the church is the broader one, the congregation is the people who actually assemble there. Now, what lies behind this is uh, the use of this terminology gives you a basic theology of worship. Okay, taking this as a whole, Ben, theologically speaking, what's the point of the tabernacle and the ritual that's performed at the tabernacle? For God to meet with his people and his people to meet with him. Right, it's as simple as that. There you have the basic theology of worship. And the miracle is that God, from the one who resides in heaven, comes to meet with his people. He doesn't get his people in ecstasy and to get them on a heavenly trip to meet with them up in there in the heavenly realms. But what does he do? He meets them where they are here on earth. And even more remarkably than that, uh, he doesn't create a holy zone uh, a part of the world that's holy, and then there's an unholy part, but he makes uh, uh, his holy presence available in the middle of his, what kind of people? His sinful, unclean people. And the miracle is that everything here is arranged to do what, spiritually speaking, is impossible. Now, what is the impossibility here? Let me put it as bluntly as possible. If you bring fire into contact with petrol, what's going to happen to the petrol? It's going to be burnt. If you bring something that's, if you bring light into the presence of darkness, what's going to happen to the darkness? It's going to be, disappear. If you bring a holy God into the presence of anybody or anything unclean, what is God's holiness going to do? 
to that which is unclean or anybody who is unclean. He will obliterate it. Um, and leave only what behind, Michael? He'll leave only what's clean behind. Now, is there any, is, is there such a thing of a clean or pure person in Israel? Now, the answer is no. Now, everything has been designed to bring about, as I say, something is impossible. How can an unclean people meet with a holy God without desecrating God's holiness and therefore incurring God's, the fire of God's wrath on the one hand? How can they meet with a holy God without um, uh, being obliterated, without dying? Now, the answer is given in the ritual. The whole ritual is designed to uh, insulate God and the people and the people in God, but insulate them not by separating them, but so that they can come together. If I can use the term insulate, I'm trying to use uh, uh, secular analogies. How can the, holy, the um, impurity be covered over removed or purified so that even sinful people can meet with the holy God in such a way that they receive nothing but blessing from God. That's what I want to explore after the break.